Welcome to Trending in Education. This is Mike Palmer. I'm really excited today to have someone from my history back here with me. Aaron Hillegas is the founder of Big Nerd Ranch, which is a company that offers intensive training courses for programmers. He's gone on to write several books, founded a company called Continua, and he's now the director of the data science program at my alma mater, New College of Florida. Aaron Hillegas, welcome to Trending in Education. Mike, it's such a treat to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like it's the early 1990s and we're hanging out in Hamilton Center, just kicking it old school style because that's what we do. But we're going to be talking about interesting stuff. You've had an interesting career really already. And I know you're just getting started. We want to talk about what you're doing at New College, but just so our listeners can get to know you a little bit better. Can you catch us up on your origin story, how you got to this point in your professional life? Definitely. So I went to college with you, which was a treat, of course. And then I went out into the world and I, uh, you know, messed around for a decade there or so, but I ended up working at Next Computer with Steve Jobs. Mm. And I was there when we merged with Apple. Mm. So a lot of the things that I had played around with in the mid nineties became the basis of Mac OS X mm. and the iPhone. Wow. After the merger, it started to feel like a big company. And I went out and did some internet startup stuff and then created my own company, Big Nerd Ranch. And Big Nerd Ranch did training and consulting on Apple technologies when Apple was just about to go out of business. Mm. So it was a, a really bad, bad business plan that I just got lucky. And Big Nerd Ranch grew to be about 120 people. Mm. I ran it for 17 years. It was a treat. We did training and we did consulting. And we trained everybody. So we trained Facebook and Google and Microsoft. And we wrote applications for a lot of people. So we wrote a lot of code for Apple, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and just to be clear, was there a ranch? No, there was never a ranch. I really wanted to build a retreat center. So yeah. one of my approaches was that I really wanted people to retreat from the world mm. and not just be at the Ramada in Albuquerque, but really somewhere quiet where they could concentrate in sort of a monastic style. Mm. I felt that you could learn a lot more when everything was just boring. That was the big goal. Make it really boring to do anything else except study yeah. software development. Uh -huh. So we ran these programs for software engineers. And then it got to be that I was done, right? Yeah. Is that it's pretty rare that you're the sort of person who can both start a company and then also keep it running. When you start a company, it's all about getting the fire going. Yeah. And then once you get to a certain size, it's mostly about putting out fires. Mm -hmm. So I was good at getting fires going, but I didn't find the putting fires out very gratifying. Yeah. So I was approached by a, a big multinational. Amdocs is a publicly traded company. And they said they would run it pretty much the same, make things comfortable for my people. And so we sold the company and it created space for me to go back to school. Mm -hmm. I went back to, to Georgia Tech which is right near my home here in Atlanta, and studied machine learning. So mm -hmm. I finished a master's degree in computational science, mm -hmm. and I was working on a PhD in machine learning at Georgia Tech. And that's when Pat Oker, the president of New College, reached out to me and said, you know, we really need someone to create a vision for our data science program. Would you come and, and be the director? And so I'm very excited that in January, I'm going to be moving down to Sarasota. And the data science program is our only graduate program, you know, New College has always been really focused on undergraduate education and it's yeah. done an amazingly good job for a really reasonable price. Mm -hmm. So you think about these small liberal arts schools like Swarthmore, which do an amazing job helping young people think about the big questions and creating a space for them to grow and experiment. And New College does that, but instead of being $60,000 a year, if you're a Florida resident, it's 6,000. Mm -hmm. If you're out of state, it's more like 30, but still very reasonable price for a top-notch liberal arts education. Yeah. So I had an amazing experience there. Some of the most brilliant, passionate, hilarious people I've ever met are people I met at, at New College. And so it's exciting for me to go back, but I also feel like data science is really important and we can get into that in just a second, but that's how I got here. Yeah, it's quite a story. I didn't realize Steve Jobs was going to be referenced in the first paragraph. I imagine there's a lot more to that story that we're not going to get into today. It sounds like there's a memoir hiding in the Big Nerd Ranch experience. We're now old enough, having graduated in the 90s, that we can write memoirs, which is a whole other thing. 
but it's really more your next chapter that we wanted to focus on, which is about data science. It's also about relevance in the current and future marketplace and about blending the traditional liberal arts education and some of the unique elements around a new college education with the tooling and the upskilling around these emerging competencies around machine learning, artificial intelligence. A lot of the emerging technology is ultimately powered by data and data science. Can you describe a little bit how you understand data science and how you understand the vision for the program you're designing? Yeah, sure. So let's take a specific problem. So in the 60s, right, computers started coming online and everyone was like, these computers are great. We can put all these wonderful rules in them and they evaluate them thousands or millions of rules a second. And so what if we just sit down and we write all the rules for translating between uh, Russian and English, for example. And so we brought together teams of linguists and we taught them how to do some programming and we laid out all, in Lisp all the rules for trying to translate. You know, this word corresponds to that, the grammatical structure. And we worked and worked and worked for, for 50 years on this problem. And always re the result was just terrible. They, it never really worked. Hmm. But some other things were going on at the same time. So if we back up, there was a, a Presbyterian minister who lived a very unremarkable life and died in 1761. His name was Thomas Bayes. Hmm. And his friend Richard Price came by his house to clean up his stuff. And Richard was a mathematician. And Thomas Bayes had been an amateur mathematician as well. And he was going through the dead vicar's stuff and found this formula. It turned out that Thomas Bayes had taken some very basic probability axioms and, and identities and did sort of fourth grade algebra on them and came up with this equation. And he looked at it, he's like, I think that this has just put a formula, a number on how we update our beliefs based on new observations. Mm. Like, this is what I believed before. This is what I've observed. And now I need to update my beliefs. And so it created a new idea of probability as, as plausibility. Like one was, this is definitely true. And zero, this is definitely false. But Bayes created these colors in between of, mm -hmm. this is very plausible and this is less plausible. Mm. And so Richard Price published this. And everybody recognized that it was really important, but we didn't have anything really useful to do with it. Yeah. And then we fast forward through, you know, the Manhattan Project actually used a lot of this. They developed a technique that made it mathematically feasible called Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations. And yes. it enabled us to do the atomic bomb. And then in 1986, well, actually 1860, a mathematician named Koshi came up with this thing, the gradient descent algorithm. And it said, I have this solution. And if I apply this formula to it, I can make it a little bit better. So it was about tweaking what you've got to make it better. Hmm. And of course, if you could do it millions of times, you would get something great out of it. Yeah. In 1986, Jeffrey Hinton came up with the idea of backpropagation, which let us put together chains of machines for doing learning. And then he used gradient descent and showed using simple calculus idea, the chain rule, we could use this gradient descent all the way through the chain. And this, this chain was deep in his mind. So this is where we get deep learning. And all the stuff that you're seeing right now, the, the images being generated and chat GPT and the uh, protein folding. I mean, yes. really, there was a revolution that's happening. And it's all on these very old ideas. Mm-hmm. When I was at New College with you, as you know, every January, we have an ISP period where we take three weeks off and we do independent study. And I needed money. So I went and worked for a government contractor, the, the MITRE Corporation, in their advanced signal processing lab. Mm -hmm. And that was 1989. Mm -hmm. And the mathematicians had all read Hinton's paper. And so we made a neural network. And, you know, the computing power was not there at all, but... Right. but we could all see that this thing learned very quickly to recognize stuff like it could tell the sound of a whale from the sound of a Russian sub turning a corner. Right. It could tell the difference between different vowels. It was a very, very powerful technique. And so I always had this sort of out of the corner of my eye. I always thought this is a really important technology and approach. And when we think about 
liberal arts education. What's really exciting about it is that we have given young people the tools to go and think about these big questions. But what's changed a lot now is that, first of all, the fields have gotten much larger. Mm -hmm. So it, if you went and studied biology for four years in 1860, you actually knew a lot of what everybody knew about biology. You were a biologist when you came out. Right. Whereas in the modern era, if you get an MS in biology, when you come out, you're a, a barista. Right. And, and I think that I, when I look at the new college people, we all spent a lot of our 20s trying to find someplace where our, our gifts could be utilized well. Right. And right. some of us went and got PhDs and some of us went and got law degrees. And some of us went and I, I sold books at the bookstore on Main Street for a while. Yeah. So it's no longer enough to come out with a bachelor's degree. And so these things that we think about physics, biology, linguistics, sociology, atmospheric science, chemistry, geology, astronomy, these were these are technical subjects. And these people have studied hard and know some really useful ideas. But when they come out in the world, there isn't immediately a career waiting for them. And you shared an article that we'll include in the show notes around the most regretted undergraduate majors, which are, are pretty much what you just outlined there, where folks who were pursuing their passion, studying something very specific, maybe not as much real world relevance to some of the academic pursuits, genuinely have struggled after their graduation to really find their path. And in many ways, that is coming full circle to some of the work that you're doing now, where if you can pair some of the social science focuses, the humanities, liberal arts, some of the domains that might be more in question in terms of their relevance, if you equip that person with some of the modern digital tooling that you're describing, that's really where the breakthroughs can happen. That's exactly right. And it's just one of the options. Of course, you can go and get a PhD. It's gonna take you 10 years of living in poverty. You can go get yourself a law degree but then you have to be a lawyer afterwards. But the idea that by adding in a deep understanding of statistics and computer programming and these modern machine learning techniques, that we can create a really promising career. And this data science program at New College has been incredibly successful at that. We're taking young people who have very good liberal arts education, great thinking skills, critical thinking skills, and we're arming them with these techniques and they're leaving and getting big jobs. So yeah. the, the median starting salary for our program is $95,000. Mm -hmm. there's, there's nobody graduating from these liberal arts schools who are making $95,000 as we had a school. Yeah. It's a hundred percent placement. But more than that, it's just really, really interesting, mm -hmm. right? When you come out with a BS in sociology and you, meet up with other sociologists and you start speaking, you sound very naive. And the reason why is because you don't have the data. You have not taken the data and made it into a cohesive story. Mm -hmm. And so we can make people who have a passion and a knowledge into really very sophisticated practitioners by giving them these techniques. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of promise for pairing a great in regular liberal arts education with these techniques to create a lot of insight, deep insight quickly about things that we just kind of wonder about. Yeah. So it's, getting back to the story of the machine translation is a perfect example. Google showed up, fired all the linguists, and they took the transcripts from the EU. The EU was translating everything they said into 13 languages, and some of the best translators in the world, mm -hmm. and they ran it through a statistical model. And they gradually, you know, let the system learn from the data instead of having people make up the rules. And now we have Google Translate and it right. is miles ahead of everything else. It translates in 133 languages now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, in a, it's an amazing time to be alive, really, that we've come to this point where these techniques that we've known about, once again, since 1750 are colliding with the mobile technology where incredible amount of data is being created every day. Mm -hmm. And then you pair that with the gamers have been spending a ton on these graphics cards. Well, it turned out the graphics cards were exactly what we needed 
to do this machine learning. And right. so suddenly we can harness the power of these GPUs to do stuff we could never have done before. Yeah. The promise of Moore's law, if you think about the math, you know, if we are continuing to get faster every year and a half, you know, it's been more years than I care to admit since I was in college. At some point, those functions start to accelerate to the point where the AI and the innovation cycles on the technology front are a lot faster than what they are on the human front. And that opens up a lot of really interesting questions around then how did humans stay relevant? How do you stay out ahead of trends? It also reminds me, you're talking about connecting some of these competencies with the technical know-how. It does remind me very much of a lot of what Steve Jobs did talk about in terms of connecting the artist and the artistry to the engineering and the technology that, you know, famously he thought of those two things as being intimately related for really his vision of an employee. I'd love to get a little bit of your perspective on that, the idea of both and really, rather than thinking of the artistry as something that artists do and the digital capabilities and innovation on the technology side or something that engineers do. I'd love to get a little bit of your perspective on how those two things connect. Yeah, I was thinking about something that Steve used to talk about. Scientific American once did publish this story on, you know, calories per mile. How far could different animals go on a hundred calories? And uh, humans were very much in the middle there. The uh, California condor was the winner. Right? It, yeah. it flapped its wings and it flew. But then they gave the human being a bicycle and it, it destroyed everything in the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so what Steve would say is what we're doing here is we're creating bicycles for the mind. Mm. There is a capacity that the human being has and we want to amplify that. And you can see that in, in every product that he created was that he was really trying to to make something that empowered humans to do more beautiful things. Yeah. There are so many things going on in data science, and it's great that we have things like chat GPT and the diffusion models. So there's stuff that generates images like Dolly, mm -hmm. that people can see the miracles that are happening. You are touched by how human these things look. That's just sort of the tip of the iceberg when you think about the revolution that's actually happening. And if we think about the protein folding problem, this was something that was it's crucial to understanding how medicines work and being able to design new medicines that are going to help humanity in so many ways. Yeah. And we could never do it. As human beings, it was just impossible. And even writing simulations that did it was impossible. But OpenAI was able to create systems that could predict, given a sequence of amino acids, how it would fold in a protein. Right. So given that we can now sequence the DNA, we can start to see, well, this sequence becomes these amino acids and that folds into this. And we can deal with that problematic protein in the body with this sort of medicine. This is a new renaissance for what's going to be happening in biology. So that, yes, I think it's true is that there are beautiful things happening. And of course, the scary part of that is you aren't going to be able to tell what was made by a human and what wasn't. So you're going to be in the comments of a Facebook post and there's going to be thousands of comments from someone who you vehemently disagree with. It'll turn out it's not a person at all. It's right. a corporation that has made a bot that is saying things that you disagree with. Right. There's certainly a dark side to the, this uh, pretending to be a human. But overall, if we look at the amazing things that are going to be coming from data science, I think it's going to be an overall uh, win for, for humanity. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to go dystopic. I'm a big black mirror devotee. So, you know, I'm always looking for a new screenplay idea, but it's easy to sometimes miss how much progress is actually happening and, and how that is unlocking new potentialities. I would be curious about your takes on the future of work and the jobs that are maybe at risk or the mindsets that are at risk around maybe not playing with your head up. You know, some are arguing that this is a new renaissance, to your point, a new revolution that is happening where if you're not AI literate, AI savvy, if you're not able to kind of engage and, you know, adopt a maker's mindset in tinkering and trying to fool around with these things, that your longer term career prospects can be put at risk. There's a survey that I love where they ask people, you know, what percentage of jobs will be destroyed by AI? 
And most people said something like 70% of all jobs will be destroyed by artificial intelligence and robots in the future. And then the person is asked, well, what about your job? And the person always said, no, no, you could never replace me with a robot or an AI. Yeah. And it's just a reminder, right? Everybody can't send their kids to above average schools. And yet everybody believes they have. The jobs that are going to be destroyed first are going to be very tedious jobs. They're going to be the, the 3Ds, right? Dangerous dull and dirty jobs, we're going to have robots and AI take those over first. We should be really excited about that because overall, just from a sociological perspective, I believe that a lot of the things that we do in the United States, especially around immigration law, is designed to keep a desperate underclass available for those sorts of jobs. And until we can eliminate those, it's hard to go and talk about making sure that everybody is living a comfortable middle-class lifestyle. Right. So what a great opportunity this is to really change the way we think about class in America. In the longer run, then we're going to start seeing a lot of jobs get destroyed, very desirable jobs getting destroyed by AI. So writing, for example, has always been just something that everyone fantasizes about giving up their job and going to an island in Maine and writing their novel. And the fact that these AIs are now taking a lot of the grunt work out of writing is a very disturbing thing. It's, that's a lot of people's first step towards that cabin in Maine is, right. is to be writing press releases. And now chat GPT will do a press release for you. It is interesting to think about the blending. You know, I've, I've talked a lot about centaurs, you know, the idea in chess when human paired with AI beats the pure AI play. And in reality, we're entering that age where... <laughs> If you are open to engaging with this, you know, you may be able to enjoy your retreat in Maine while you're writing your book, when a lot of the grinding out of the 50,000, 100,000 words, you get something to edit from a bot, and then it's on you to really differentiate it and add like the human layer and create the whole that's ultimately greater than the sum of its parts, as someone who's been working closely with technology your whole career and helping people understand that, what do you think about that idea of the centaur, the, the blending of, of human and AI? So I think that's a really compelling vision. And of course, that's what we all would like to believe. All those people saying my job will never be replaced by AI. They're always thinking I will be augmented and I will be more powerful in my job because of AI, but they can never get rid of me. Uh -huh. And that may be true for the next decade or two. I mean, it's interesting, right? To me, technology has moved at a glacial pace, right? I was at the center of everything in 1994. And when I look at how little has happened since 1994, I'm just astonished, right? In 1994, the internet already existed. The, the graphical user interface already existed. A lot of the stuff that we use today, a lot of people hadn't experienced it in 1994, but it was, it was there, Yeah, even probably 1984. So it's interesting how slowly technology has actually moved. I mean, where are the flying cars, right? Where, yeah. Yeah. I was so, promised a vision from the Jetsons from the early days, and we're still not there, Aaron. I, I want my flying cars. And the brain interface. I was sure that I would have a chip in my brain so that I could have Wikipedia with me at all times by now. But then, of course, we have a really interesting moment as well in that things are not, don't have a common slope, right? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a constant slope. It's getting faster and faster. So, yeah, yeah. for example, Google recently did a talk about using their AI to help redesign their AI chip. So the AIs are now making the AIs faster and mm -hmm. consume less power. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting loop at this point where the technology is making its own technology faster and faster. Yeah. So that's when people talk about the singularity, they're yeah. like, oh, it's going steeper and steeper. Eventually it's gonna be basically vertical where things are just going to get smarter so fast. So we have to take both of those, right? Is the world 10 years from now is probably going to look a lot like the world looks right now. And at that same thing is that underneath it, there is this current of a faster and faster, smarter and smarter technology. I don't know the answer to that question. It's a great science fiction question. And of course, we love the centaur image. And I just think yeah. that a lot of people are just going to lose their jobs. And that's a whole 
problem with the social safety net. And yeah. I think we're going to have to address it when middle-aged white guys are getting replaced by AI. So they will definitely make sure that the government has taken care of that. Yeah. But in the meantime, what I really want to do is convince young people to come to new college to study data science with me so that they can be in charge of the AIs rather than slaves to them. Exactly. And that's kind of the direction I've been going lately around mindsets versus skill sets, where on the one hand, I think we have to admit that we're going to need to continue to develop new skills for the rest of our working lives and really the rest of our lives, and that will continue to be longer. So the hard skills, the technical competencies, we're going to have to continue to ramp on those, which is why your program is equipping folks with what those are right now. But also those will change so that we have to equip folks with mindsets that are flexible, are resilient, and even perseverant enough to power through the iterations where, you know, by the time you're in your 50s, you're like, I spent a lot of my life learning. When do I get a chance to take a break? It's more like there are certain mindsets that are really essential for like a healthy career and a healthy, continuous development really throughout your life. I'd love to get a little of your perspective as someone who's been a great example of that, where you've continued to learn, continue to take on new challenges. As you're training up young people, what mindsets do you think are most essential and, and maybe values or, or sort of higher level thinking are important to convey to rising talent? I've always really loved learning. And, and I don't know if that's a self-selecting thing. You know, maybe I was just born with that. But my father was an engineer and a good teacher and a very curious and clever man. Mm -hmm. And that was always like mm -hmm. part of the joy of being alive was to learn new things. And the most sort of sad episodes of my life are where I didn't feel like I was learning new things, that most of my day was spent keeping the company on the tracks. Yeah. So for me, I, I don't know what's inbred. I know that when I got to new college and I met another 400 people who had that same mindset, mm -hmm. that that was, that felt like coming home. Yeah. And once again, we have to look at a historical perspective is that we didn't used to live for 90 years. A, a large number of us, if we've made it to 50, we're going to make it to 90. Yeah. There was a time when you would be an apprentice and then you would get your own blacksmith shop and then you would do the same damn thing for the rest of your life. But it's important to remember that the rest of your life might be just 20 years. I think you need to start thinking long term about keeping your mind challenged. We're told by psychologists that 99% of the things that we think today are the same thoughts we thought yesterday. Hmm. And when you're learning new things, you may move that line from 99 to 95% of the thoughts that you're thinking today are the same thoughts you thought yesterday. But isn't that, you know, once again, that's just such a more interesting mind to live in. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a treat and should be treated as a gift. And we just need to really structure the world so it's treated like a gift. We need to say, you know, we're hiring you and we'd love for you to work at this company for 20 years, but every two years you need to take a month off and go get some more education because the industry that we're in is changing so quickly that we need you to stay on top of it. And the person who's interviewing you say, excellent, I'm so excited that you are actually taking responsibility for that growth, that you mm -hmm. recognize that's part of my career. Mm -hmm. I like to think that I did that for my people at Big Nerd Ranch, that I recognized that we were in a very fast moving place. And that even though we were rushing to get things done for our clients, there was always a, a moment where we could step back and say, what's the best solution to this question that we're, that we're grappling with? Mm -hmm. What is this code going to look like in 10 years after it's gone through a lot of changes? Mm -hmm. But I think that, uh, that all employers who want people to stay with their companies over the long term need to start thinking about structuring continuous learning into the job and not just on top of the job where the person has already worked 40 hours or, or eight hours in a day and then is expected to sit down and do two hours of deep thought. It's just, it's just yeah. not reasonable. We only have so much attention in a day. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's fascinating for me to think about the culture building work that you did at Big Nerd Ranch and then the culture that we both experienced at New College back in the 90s. And, and thankfully, from my perspective, a lot of what I really loved about New College then still seems to be resonant and present in what New College is doing now. Looking ahead with the job that you have, how are you thinking about building a culture at New College that can be 
relevant to the future of work, can be connected to some of the lessons learned from the private sector, and can really equip folks with the skill sets and the mindsets and the tools they need to be effective in their future lives. New College is a fascinating place in that it is that liberal arts education at the price of a good stereo. And as a result, people who were there tended not to talk about money. It was sort of an embarrassing thing. If you had money, you didn't talk about money because you're embarrassed you had it. If you didn't have money, you didn't talk about it because you were embarrassed. So we didn't talk about money and it was considered like poor form. It was very odd to get out in the world where people were very comfortable showing off their wealth. I'm going to tell a little New College story that I love. At New College, like a lot of places where there's diverse income, betting is challenging because, of course, to a rich kid, 20 bucks doesn't mean anything. But to a poor kid, 20 bucks means a lot. So if you were going to bet 20 bucks on a basketball game, it wasn't fair. So at New College, we developed the solution, which was the shaved head. If you lost the basketball game, the winner got to shave your head, cut your hair any way they wanted. And you had to leave it that way for 24 hours before yeah. you could actually, most people just shaved it all off and started again Yeah, because they were such terrible hairdos. Do you remember this? Yes, of course. I remember it shooting pool, but yes, it's the same, the same concept. Absolutely. Yes. I saw somebody lose their hair over Connect Four once. <laughs> I mean, anyway. Clippers were a great innovation in the early 90s. Clippers is another place where we really haven't seen the next gen hair clippers. The collision of the past and the future coming together with the clippers and the liberal arts education and the basketball, it was doomed. Anyway, what I wanted to say was that at New College, talking about money is hard. And so one of the things that I have to do is work with Dwayne Peterson, the head of the career planning team. And it's just a, an amazing resource for the kids and was not there when we were in yeah. school. And so Dwayne helps people with their resumes and do mock interviews and talk about what do they want to do in the world when they get out and how can they prepare now to be relevant in the world. Mm -hmm. It's coming down to me and Dwayne being the, the voices on campus of saying, hey, this is great. We can all sit around and talk about uh, Marx and Angles all afternoon long. And at the end of the day, we should also take a moment to think, hey, at the end of this, I'd really like to have health insurance. <laughs> And I'd love to be able to afford to buy a house one day. And I want to be relevant. I want when I walk into the room for people to listen to me because my knowledge and my experience are relevant. Mm -hmm. So how do we do it? I don't know. I think that students are ready to have that conversation. But yeah, walking in and saying, you know, your, your passion is ballet. That's great. Let's be honest. There's no ballet job out there. What, what can we do that you're good at and the world really needs? How do we look for the skills that are going to help you stand out and be relevant in the world? It's an awkward conversation everywhere in the world where we tell kids you should follow your passions, but especially at a place like New College where talking about money is not socially appropriate. So then it looks like there is some potential to bring that relevance into education and in higher ed, the rising generations are different perhaps than we were. How do you understand the current student, I guess they're calling them Gen Z nowadays, we're, we're a little more technically Gen X. What do you think about the rising generation and what advice are you giving to them? How are you thinking about working with that population? You know, for every year since 1200, every professor has said, oh, this year's are the worst. They are they are the most fragile little flowers and so dumb and so lazy. And that's still true. Though, If you talk to the professors, they're like, ah, the kids today. But the reality is when you talk to the young people, they're still curious. They still want to be relevant and lead interesting careers. It is a different mindset. And I, I have to be honest is that uh, I've been teaching at Georgia State and I've been at, at Georgia Tech. I don't know how much the difference is the location, you know, the, the people who apply to New College are very different from the people to apply to Georgia Tech who apply to Georgia State. I'm now on Instagram. I'm trying desperately to market my stuff. And I've been following the kids at New College's Instagram accounts, and they're still fascinating, still curious, still creative, still impatient. And I'm going to look forward to being part of that. And whatever wisdom and, and grace I can bring into their lives, I think will be a plus. That's awesome. And not to mention the social capital of those of us later on in our careers trying to make connections across 
generations and, and provide some some different perspectives. That's ultimately a win-win for both sides of that equation. We learn by being exposed to folks who are earlier in their lives, frequently we're inspired by them. And at the same time, we have the connections and the wherewithal and maybe can see lines of pathways that they may not see otherwise. We're getting close to conclusion here, Aaron. It's been amazing to get some time with you. New College is ncf.edu. We'll include some links to New College and to Aaron's program as part of the show notes. As we conclude here, I always like to give guests concluding thoughts, takeaways for folks as they're wrapping up from a conversation that really went to quite a few different places, which is amazing. So thanks again for joining us. But as folks head back to their lives, what's some advice, some takeaways you might have as we wrap up here? So let me just do some plugs here, which is if you know a young person who's curious and is finishing a bachelor's degree that is not going to immediately lead to a great career, I would really love it if you would give them a little nudge to come and look at what we're doing. I think that if a very reasonable price, you do three semesters of classes, you do one semester that's a pay paid practicum, and that usually 75% of the time leads directly into your new job that pays well and has health benefits. Talk to the young people, let them know that we are out there and that's a possibility for their future. Let me also quick put a quick plug in. I am working on a free series of textbooks and, and tests so that young people can get up to speed for these sorts of questions before college. So if you would go to continua.org, it's spelled with a K, continua is Esperanto for continuous, because in the world, we have these two-minute videos on Bayes' theorem, but there's a lacking of a four-year arc by which you learn math and computer science and physics and data science. So what I'm trying to do is create that four-year arc and make it free so that anybody, no matter how poor the neighborhood they grow up in, can get access to top quality education. So I'm always looking for volunteers. And this summer, I would love to have a summer intern to help me write it. So if you're out there and you want to be part, we also take donations so I can actually pay that intern. There's a donation button on the website. I'd love for you to be part of it. It is a 501c3, so you get to write the donations off. Finally, I just want to put a plug in for New College. You and I both went to New College. Amazing people. If you look at, you know, William Dudley was the president of the New York Reserve Bank. He went to New College. You look at someone like Jen Granick. William Thurston won the Fields Medal in Mathematics. He's from New College. David Allen, who did Getting Things Done, New College. Given that we've only graduated about 4,000 people, yep. it's amazing the sort of thinkers that have come out of New College. And if you are curious and a sort of a self-starter and you don't need a lot of adult supervision, New College is definitely a place you should check out. Awesome. Fantastic stuff. Aaron, thanks so much for joining me. Really an inspiration to your fellow Novo Collegians, but also to folks out there in the world trying to stay curious, stay frisky, stay on top of what's new and emerging. Thanks so much for joining me on today's show. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Awesome. For our listeners, if you liked what you heard, please write us a review, share the good word. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. 